Sisters, his black brothers and sisters have suffered down the years. He has been even more bitter about America's Jews. But even though many Americans, black and white, perceive him as a racist, this leader of the Nation of Islam, with his Million Man March last October, made himself a force to be reckoned with. In person, this rather private man can come across as earnest and reasonable in professing his desire for a true reconciliation between the races and religions in America. But almost everything he says has been drowned out by the current controversy over his recent meetings in the Middle East with sworn enemies of the United States. Tomorrow, Minister Farrakhan embarks on a nationwide tour to explain his motives for that trip and to blunt the criticism that has led the Justice Department to investigate whether he must now register as a foreign agent. For me to register as a foreign agent is to give America control over what I say. And that's what America wants, is control over what I say. In the foreign agent law, you can't influence public opinion. That's my business, to influence public opinion, especially when liars are deceiving the American people. So no, I will never register as a foreign agent because I'm not that. Farrakhan says he does not worry about what the government thinks of his traveling to Tehran, where he spoke to millions of Iranians celebrating the 17th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution, an uprising that led to the taking of the U.S. hostages, or about his much-publicized visit to Baghdad to confer with Iraq Saddam Hussein. On his return home to Chicago in February, he would explain himself only to his brothers and sisters in the nation of Islam. My job was to get up quickly and get out of America and connect the nation of Islam and black America to Africa, to the Middle East, and to the Muslim world. That was why I had to go. And one of the first places he went to was Libya, where he received a warm welcome from Muammar Gaddafi. The Libyan news agency, JANA, reported Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi saying the following, Our confrontation with America used to be like confronting a fortress from outside. Today we have found a loophole to enter the fortress from within. You are a loophole <laughs> for Muammar Gaddafi, who you say offered you a billion dollars, who has in the past given you five million dollars? He offered me more than a billion. He offered me their wealth of the oh. nation of Libya behind the nation of Islam. You were a loophole for Muammar Gaddafi? Well, I, I don't know what he means by loophole. Maybe you ought to invite him on 60 Minutes. I have. And ask him. But certainly, I can't be a functionary for Muammar Gaddafi. However, however, I would be most happy to detail my conversation with him if I'm subpoenaed before Congress... That subpoena to talk to the Congress about his travels to America's enemies in the Middle East has not been issued. Nonetheless, I reminded him... He didn't go to Egypt, where Sadat and Begin made peace. A Muslim and a Jew. He didn't go to Jordan, where King Hussein and Shimon Peres have made an accord didn't go to Israel, where Arafat and Rabin finally shook hands. Instead of just going to a lot of dictatorships, to go to a democratic country where Jews and Muslims are beginning to reconcile might have been a wonderful sign for you, Minister Farrakhan, to show to the world. If they're on the road to reconciliation, that's fine. But, you know, there's also the possibility of my being assassinated overseas. Egypt right now is a place where it's very, very volatile. And I thought that in that surrounding, it might not be the best place for me at this time. If I went to Israel, I don't think Israel would be the best place for me to be at this time considering the view 
that most Jews have of Louis Farrakhan. You go to Nigeria, which is, if not the most corrupt nation in Africa, and it is, it could be the most corrupt nation in the world, Minister Farrakhan. Oh, and now, Mr. Wallace. It is the most corrupt nation that I have ever covered. I've been there 25 years ago, and I've been there as recently as last year. Fine. So what? 35 years old. That's what that nation is. Now, here's America, 226 years old. You love democracy? But there in Africa, you're trying to force these people into a system of government that you just have accepted 30 years ago, black folk got the right to vote. You're not in any moral position to tell anybody how corrupt they are. You should be quiet and let those of us who know our people go there and help them get out of that condition. But America should keep her mouth shut wherever there's a corrupt regime, as much hell as America has raised on the earth. No, I will not allow America or you, Mr. Wallace, to condemn them as the most corrupt nation on earth. When you have spilled the blood of human beings, has, has Nigeria dropped an atomic bomb and killed people in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Have they killed off millions of Native Americans? How dare you put yourself in that position as a moral judge? I think you should keep quiet because with that much blood on America's hands, you have no right to speak. I will speak because I don't have that blood on my hand. Yes, there's corruption there. Yes, there's mismanagement of resources. Yes, there is abuse. There's abuse in every nation on earth, including this one. So let's not play holy to moralize on them. Let's help them. I'm not moralizing. I'm asking a question and I got an answer. Why would you put it as the most corrupt regime in the world? That doesn't make sense. Can you think me. of one more corrupt? Yeah, I'm living in one. I'm living in one. Yes, you've done a hell of a thing on this earth, so you should not be the one to talk. You should be quiet when it comes to moral condemnation. In my judgment. I didn't mean to be so fiery. No, no, that's good. It's good. That's my passion. I first recognized the passion of the black Muslim movement and Louis Farrakhan way back in 1959 when I anchored a broadcast entitled The Hate That Hate Produced. The black Muslim meeting we filmed included a mock trial, a kind of passion play, where the white man was judged for crimes against the black race. The voice you will hear is that of the prosecutor. This tape will show you why White America was was worried about the black Muslims. I charge the white man, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, with being the greatest murderer on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest peace breaker on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest adulterer on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest troublemaker on earth. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I ask you. Bring back a verdict of guilty as charged. I'm sure you remember that. You wrote it. Yes. <laughs> and you but, believed that then? Oh, yes. I believe it now. <laughs> History is not false. If he says that the white man did all these things, I did not write the white man's history. That history is written in murder, in the bloodshed of the darker peoples of the world, and even in the bloodshed of your own people. Back at that time, Elijah Muhammad, the man whom you revere and still regard as, as the Messiah, in a certain sense, no? Yes. He wanted a separation. I couldn't even talk to him. Do you still believe in separation of the races? I believe, uh, Mike, that if we can't get along in peace, then we should separate. We have serious differences that are exacerbated now over time between black and white. The question that we have to answer, are those differences irreconcilable? Are they? I don't know. Have we tried as hard as we could to reconcile them. And if we have, and we cannot, then separation would be the best answer. 
But you are suggesting that it's basically the white man's fault. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Wallace. I'm not going to say that. Because justice would not be served if I said it was all the fault of white people. Reason that we, you... We have to take some blame in this ourselves. As black people, we can't sit around waiting for white people to do for us what we should be doing for ourselves. And our failure to do this is our fault. White folk have done bad by us in the past. Yes, that is true. And they do some bad by us today. But if we did better by ourselves today, we could help to reconcile this difference. Farrakhan's call for black men to do better for themselves was the theme of his Million Man March. Last fall, he called black men from all across America to come to Washington for a Day of Atonement. And they came. His message? Change your lives. But after the march, he says, he was depressed, somehow sad, hurt by the mainstream media who he felt failed to give him proper credit for his extraordinary accomplishment in organizing the march. He withdrew to the Nation of Islam's compound in Phoenix, Arizona. He disappeared from the public eye for almost three months. Then he re-emerged for that tour of Africa and the Middle East. To observers like Dr. C. Eric Lincoln, a distinguished black historian, and Professor Emeritus at Duke University, who has studied the Nation of Islam since the 1950s. Farrakhan's trip squandered a great opportunity. Professor Lincoln told me he was disgusted with your trip to the Middle East and to Africa. He said, he said, he blew it, you. After the Million Man March, he feels that you had what you were after. You had, you had put yourself in the position as a leader of the entire black community in America, which you had never had before, and then that you just threw it away with the trip to Africa. <laughs> <In> the... <laughs> now, this is from a man, yes. scholar, been a guest in your home, yes. loves you and your wife. And I love him. Let me say this. There are many people like Dr. Lincoln who think just like that. They were hurt because they watched my struggle. And they said, ah, now he has arrived, okay? Right. And they felt not only that I had arrived for me, I had arrived for them because secretly they have wanted to embrace Louis Farrakhan. And just as they were about to put their arms around me, mm -hmm. I went to Africa and the Middle East, and to quote them, I blew it. You spoke, in their view, against your own country. You know, some of your best patriots are those who never went along with the government position. Listen. Everyone that stepped back from me, they didn't run away. They're behind a tree looking. Is he going to make it? How's he going to get out of this one? Oh, my God. I'm not a politician. I don't do what people think I should do. I do what God inspires me to do. Which one of these leaders would have asked me to call for a million men to come to Washington? Not one. That was an inspiration from God that I followed. And they all applauded. Great thing mm -hmm. you did. Mm -hmm. God inspired me to get up and leave this country. And before long, those same critics will say, I was wrong, Farrakhan. I want to show you now, Minister Farrakhan, an excerpt from your speech, Save Your Stay in Chicago a couple of months ago. I know you want to kill me, but I just raised the price. You want me dead, but you're going to pay a price to get that result. Who wants to kill you? Why? I believe that conversation is raging right now in government circles because I appear to be interfering with America's foreign policy objectives in Africa and in the Middle East. They want me 
kind of silenced or muzzled. And if they can destroy my credibility, as they did Martin Luther King first, take him down in the eyes of his people and then assassinate him. I don't believe that America is beyond that. I believe it's being discussed right now in the White House. I believe it's being discussed by certain members of Congress. How are you going to deal with Farrakhan? Yes, I presented you with a dilemma, but I'm warning America. I'm not Martin Luther King. I'm not Malcolm X. I'm in a little different time frame. And I think you would be wise to see if God is with me. And if God is with me, you would be well to leave me alone. More from Louis Farrakhan on Mike Tyson and rape, on Malcolm X, and on his relationship with America's Jewish community when we return. Louis Farrakhan despairs of the manner in which too many black men in America, he says, treat women, their wives and others too. I asked him why he had recently gone to Las Vegas to watch a convicted rapist, Mike Tyson, fight for the heavyweight title. We talked with him before Mike Tyson's latest episode of alleged sexual harassment in Chicago. What message does it send to your sisters in Islam that you went, in effect, to glorify a convicted rapist? Do you deny another human being the chance to change, to be made better? Before Mike Tyson went to prison, mm -hmm. he visited me, we talked. And I told Mike, I said, brother, whether you are guilty of this charge or not, and he swore to me that he was not guilty. I said, but whether you're guilty of this charge or not, you have been abusive of women. I said, you know, with me, rape is a crime for which I believe the death penalty should be applied. Because what you've done to the woman, only God can bring her back from that. I said, and I wrote him a letter when he was in prison. I said, Mike, you will not leave prison until you learn the lesson that God intended for you to learn. So when I went to see Mike in his fight for the championship, I went to see whether this reformed human being, by the grace of God, would win his championship back. And I'm very proud of Mike. I'm very proud of the change that he has made in his life. You were brought up as an Episcopalian? Yes, sir. By your mother? Yes, sir. And your father, what did you know of your father? Very little, very little. He was from the Caribbean, from the island of Jamaica a very light-skinned black man who I believe uh, had uh, white uh, parentage, black and white parentage. He was a philanderer, if you pardon the expression, and my mother uh, broke up with him and reared us by herself. Did you miss not having a father? Yes, but my mother was so strong she was both mother and father. And that's true in the black community in America today, no? Yes, yes, it is. My dad uh, liked women, and uh, I don't know too many men who don't. <laughs> but my mother uh, loved her children and did her best to make a future for us, and for that, I am eternally grateful. It was his mother who encouraged him to play the violin, which he still plays today. In fact, the man born 63 years ago as Louis Eugene Walcott, who grew up in Roxbury, Massachusetts, originally wanted a career in show business as a singer. You called yourself the charmer. I did. And since my parents were from the Caribbean and I loved Calypso so well, I began singing Calypso. And every Calypsonian chooses some name. And I remember I was in Montreal, Canada, and uh, the, the people uh, were sitting with me one night. They said, you are so charming. 
And so from that, I started calling myself the charmer. The charmer. <laughs> I wish that I could be charming today. It was in 1955, after hearing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad speak, that he dedicated his voice to the black Muslim movement. Cause that's the only way we're gonna be free. Well, we now he was Lewis X. His mentor was Malcolm X, who was eventually gunned down at Harlem's Audubon Ballroom in 1965. Farrakhan has steadfastly denied any involvement in that murder. When Malcolm X's daughter, Kubila, was arrested last year for hiring a hitman to kill Farrakhan in retaliation for her father's murder, he would not press charges against her, believing the FBI had set her up. And that finally brought about a public reconciliation with Betty Shabazz, Malcolm's widow. I can't say that all the differences are reconciled. I can't say that the pain and the hurt of 30 years and the loss of her husband is all of a sudden forgotten. But I can say, Mr. Wallace, that atonement and reconciliation is absolutely necessary. And we took that theme from Jewish tradition. You don't trust the media, you've said so. You don't trust whites, you've said so. You don't trust Jews, you've said so. Well. Here I am, white, Jewish, and a reporter. So why in the world did you trust me enough to sit down to talk to me this way, well, Minister Farrakhan? Let, let me say this. I, I would not say that all whites and all Jews and all media are untrustworthy. That is not a fair characterization of my That's thinking. That's the perception of a lot right. of people in America. Perception is not necessarily reality. Take a look at this clip. You are wicked deceivers of the American people. You have sucked their blood. You are not real Jews, those of you that are not real Jews. You are the synagogue of Satan. And you have wrapped your tentacles around the U.S. government. And you are deceiving and sending this nation to hell. But I warn you in the name of Allah, you would be wise to leave me alone. But if you choose to crucify me, know that Allah will crucify you. That's a message of reconciliation. It's bound to be perceived as anti-Semitic and you know it and you do it over and over again. I quote it. The synagogue of Satan is, a, is part of a scripture in the book of Revelations, the second chapter and the third chapter. It says, and I quote, those who say they are Jews and are not, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. The people you're talking to there, the people who saw that on television, they aren't students of the Bible as you are. They don't know the scripture as you do. What they hear, what I heard, was what overtones I... of absolute, you were sticking it to the Jews once again. In reality, Mr. Wallace, you know, I've heard whites and Jews say they're good and bad in every race. Yeah. And if they're good and bad in every race, does that not apply to Jews? Are of they course. good Jews? And are there bad Jews? And if there are good Jews, what constitutes a good Jew? Uh, give, me a, give me a list of a half a dozen good Jews. No, 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 no. no not, uh, only God knows who the good are. There are good appearing Muslims. There are good appearing Christians. There are good appearing <clears throat> Jews. But God knows who is good. And so the good are those who live by the standard that makes you a Jew. Once you deviate from that standard, you're not a Jew anymore, from my vantage point. Have you talked about bad Muslims? Of course. Who? There are bad Muslims. There are Muslims who deviate from the path of God. I'm not anti-Semitic. I do not hate Jews. 
I want this to be very clear. I do not hate Jews. I do not hate people because their skin is white. What I hate is evil and injustice and exploitation, whether a black does it, whether a white does it, whether a Jew, a Muslim, or a Christian does it. And Farrakhan, despite all his past rhetoric, now says he wants to make a genuine effort at reconciliation with the Jewish community in America. I am willing to visit the board of rabbis in any city in America, sit down and talk with those scholars of Judaism. I am willing to visit a synagogue and speak to the Jewish people because I do not want Jewish children to believe that they have somebody who, if he comes into great power, will put them in ovens. I don't want that for my children I don't want that for your children. And if we don't want that for our children, then the question is, what are we willing to do today to stave off any ugly future? Have and you that, made that kind of a suggestion before, Minister Farrakhan? Yes, I have. And what has been the response? Well, there are always preconditions. Well, Farrakhan, have you toned down your rhetoric? Well, you I sure haven't toned down your rhetoric. You know, I can't tone down what I believe to be truth. And if it's truth, and I'm, if I'm in error, how am I going to know that unless there's a dialogue? And you say, no, Farrakhan, here's the truth. And if you can show me that I love truth, and I hope that I'm humble enough to be open enough to see the truth if you show it to me. My Jewish friends will say, Wallace, come on up. We've heard all this before. He's not to be trusted. You know that. Well, that's on both sides. You oh, know, I know it. That's on both sides. I could say, well, we've heard that before, too, mm -hmm. of reconciliation. Look at the Indians. You know, I mean, look at all the treaties that were signed. Yeah. And look at where they are. Mm -hmm. So let's, you know, let's not talk about trust, because I really don't think that you've earned trust. But we can earn it together. But time is running out on all of us. And I think if we're going to make that move, why not? Let's make it now. As we said, Louis Farrakhan, with the success of the Million Man March, made himself a man to watch in America. How many legions does he have? It's hard to say, but there is no doubt that beyond his card-carrying followers in the Nation of Islam, there are millions of Americans, both black and white, who now take him seriously. The question is, which voice is the real voice of Louis Farrakhan? The private one? that says he is serious about a genuine move toward reconciliation or the harsher rhetoric of his public voice. As he starts his nationwide tour tomorrow, it will be interesting to see which voice he'll choose. Ch -ch 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 Africa!